Um, hi everyone. So as Tilly said, I'm Charlotte. I taught um, the biology lessons over the summer for the My Tutor Online School. So I might have come across some of you before. Um, today, as seen on this slide, we're going to be talking about variation and evolution. So this is going to be carrying on from where Olivia got to um, in the overall topic of inheritance. And hopefully it should tie in really well. We've got quite a lot to cover today. Um, so I've got a brief summary here of what that is. You should be able to see me now as well in the lesson space camera there. Okay, so today we're going to talk about causes of variation, evolution by natural selection, selective breeding, genetic engineering. And we're also, if we've got time at the end, going to tag on a little bit about extinction and fossils as well. But we'll see how we do. If not, we'll cover that tomorrow. As usual, as you've been doing for the past three days, feel free to use the Q&A and the chat as well. Um, ideally, we will keep questions to the Q&A and I'll check that at regular points throughout the session um, just to make sure that we catch up with any questions as we go. Um, and keep the chat as well for any discussion and things that we have. And I'll ask you a few questions and things in there as well. So hopefully we can keep that, that moving too. Okay, so let's carry on today with variation and evolution. So I thought we'd start um, the slides with uh, a bit of a question really, so what is variation and what makes us all different? So uh, answers in the chat, if you like, I'm going to pop that up. What do you think makes us all different? Okay, good, we've got a few answers already, DNA, genes, alleles, yeah, really good. So this is picking up on a lot of the stuff that Olivia um, has been through with you. So hopefully this is a little bit of a recap as well. Variation by random mutation, yeah, that's a really good answer there from Oliver as well. Um, different environmental and genetic factors, yes, very good. Possibly a slightly giveaway on the slide there, but that's all good. Recessive alleles, yes. So all of this stuff that you've picked up on so far through this module that Olivia's been teaching, um, it all contributes to variation within a population. Okay, so I'm gonna pop. Yeah, phenotypes and genotypes, really good. Dominant alleles, recessive alleles, fab. Okay, I'm gonna pop the chat back down again. And I wanted to talk about nature versus nurture, which is essentially um, how uh, genetics and the environment affect each of us individually when you consider our phenotypes. So our phenotypes is how we look, our genotypes is our genetic makeup. So for nature, which is our genetic variation, so you might have heard of this debate before, nature versus nurture and what that, what that contributes to in terms of variation in the population. So genetic variation can be within species and between species. Um, so you might already know, but a species is defined as a population of individuals that can interbreed, whereas different species cannot interbreed. Their genetic variation is so different that they can no longer mate. Um, that genotype translates to the phenotype. And I wondered whether you could give me some examples of phenotypic characteristics. So characteristics of how we look that are due to our genes. So back to the chat again. And some good, good eye color is a classic one. Blood group, hair color. Yeah, all really good. Skin color. Height is a bit of a product of both actually. Height is quite an interesting one. Accent is another interesting one. That's a really good suggestion. So how much of our accent is due to our genetics and how much to our environment? Actually, I would suggest that accent is probably environment only. Earlobe type, yep. Yeah. Freckles. Okay, so then in turn, uh, factors that are due to the environment or the circumstances that we grow up in and how they affect our phenotype. So a good example was accent. 
that um, just came up. And the height as well can be partly due to our circumstances, because uh, if you um, have very good levels of nutrition, you're more likely to reach your maximum height than, say, if you have less to eat, and then you might not grow as big. More examples of how, yes, weight is a really good one. So weight, again, is a combination of both. So you can be genetically predisposed to be a bigger person or a smaller person, but your circumstances can help dictate that as well. So how much, again, you have available to eat is a big part of it. How much exercise you do, those are the two big factors there personality that's a really interesting one how much of that is due to our genes again that one's a combination as well okay so i've got an interesting little table here i'll just move it up so you can see it a bit better because the lesson scheduler there is in the way um so we've got some differences here in pairs of adults this was a really cool study that was done on twins so there's lots of ethics that are involved with working with twins because obviously it's not very ethical to separate twins intentionally at birth and then see what happens to them. But there are cases of twins that have been, say, fostered by different families. And so this study um, looked at the differences in pairs of adults. So we've got four columns there, identical twins that were brought up together, identical twins that were brought up apart non-identical twins that were brought up together and non-twin siblings that were brought up together. Uh, and the reason they've looked at twins is that uh, identical twins have exactly the same genetic makeup. So they are genetically the same. So their genetic variation is zero. And if you look there, the bigger the number, the bigger the difference, basically. So identical twins that are brought up together have the lowest differences. Identical twins that are brought up apart also have fairly low differences, particularly in height there. Mass in kilograms um, is kind of on a par with non-identical twins um, brought up together and non-twin siblings brought up together. So that suggests perhaps a bit more of an environmental impact there. And then IQ as well, the difference there is slightly smaller in identical twins that are brought up apart. Um, rather than uh, siblings or um, non-identical twins that are brought up at the same time. So that suggests a bit more of a genetic factor in there too. So quite interesting to think about um, how the differences and the variation between us is attributed to genetic or environmental factors. Okay, so that brings us to our next point, which is evolution by natural selection. So that variation between us allows that evolution by natural selection and that is helped along by the mutations that cause that um, genetic variation within a population so uh, mutations you might have heard of before I suspect Olivia has mentioned them if not covered them a little bit more but just to recap their changes in the DNA code they happen randomly when cells divide and they may affect phenotypes I have uh, put some words in, in capitals there. It's really important to remember that mutations happen randomly. These are not dictated and they may affect phenotypes. And because our genetic code, um, some genes can be coded for by more than one combination of bases within a codon. So, You've probably come across there's three bases per gene um, and therefore it's occasionally possible that, that a mutation can happen and not make any change to a phenotype so not make any change to the characteristics the outward characteristics of an organism this is an example of a, um, a mutation here so you can see there's a, um, a difference between the two highlighted um, sequences here. So CTC on the top is replaced by CAC, therefore partners with GUG at the bottom and GAG at the top. So just a little, a little change there. Now those mutations mean that within a population there will always be some variation in the genetic code. And Charles Darwin, who you've probably heard of, came up with this theory survival of the fittest and this runs on four principles and you do need to be able to remember these so 
The first part is that individual organisms within a particular species may show a wide range of phenotype and genetic variation. Phenotypic and genetic variation. We know that. We know we're all different. We know there can be mutations that cause those extra differences within a population. Two, individuals with characteristics most suited to the environment are more likely to survive and breed successfully. That also kind of makes sense. So uh, if, for example, um, take giraffes, those with longer necks might have, so they might have had a mutation that they made their necks grow a bit longer, back before all giraffes were, were long necked. And that one particular giraffe that had a slightly longer neck, that um, would have had a slight advantage in that it could reach leaves that were higher up to eat. Therefore, they're more likely to eat well and be fit enough to mate and to um, have offspring. That leads us on to the third part, which is that the alleles, so the types of gene that have enabled these individuals to survive are then passed on to the next generation. So they're inherited, they're passed on. And then if two populations become so different that they can no longer interbreed, they have formed a new species. Okay, so we've got a little bit of speciation in there at the end there as well. So that's four principles that you need to remember there. I can see there's some questions. I'm going to stop four questions in, uh, I think, a couple of slides time. So we'll do them in blocks. If that works. Okay, just going to give you a couple of seconds in case you're copying that down, but we can come back to that. Okay. So let's take this idea a bit further. We're all humans. Humans are really good at innovating. And so having identified evolution through natural selection, we all thought, how can we speed that up? And how can we turn it to our advantage? And the result of that was selective breeding. Selective breeding is artificially selecting which individuals breed. And that means that you can select for desired characteristics. So we can select the giraffes with the longer necks. We return to that earlier example. In modern life, this translates to, uh, particularly in livestock, so crops that um, produce a greater yield, that are resistant to disease. Animals that produce more meat or milk, so modern cows, they have been selectively bred to produce more milk or more meat, depending on what type of cow they are. Domestic animals as well, so dogs are a great example. Dogs are descended from wolves and back in Back in however long ago, humans decided that they wanted to breed wolves that had more um, gentle characteristics. So they became better pets, more loyal, better natured, and good guard dogs was how they started off. So all dogs today are through selective breeding from wolves, basically. Uh, brightly coloured flowers is another one. So the decorative flowers that you see in shops are often selectively bred from wild um, individuals. So brassicas have been selectively bred into loads and loads of really different forms and they all have the same base, same genetic basis. So cauliflowers are a brassica. They were selectively bred to have bigger flower buds. Then cabbages as well, they were selectively bred to have terminal leaf buds. Brussels sprouts are the same family. They look very different to cabbages and cauliflowers. And then broccoli as well kale which is more about the leaves and uh, kohlrabi as well which is more about the stem so thinking about that there are a couple of limitations which is why i've put the little picture of the pug there so because you're repeatedly selecting for desired characteristics you're repeatedly selecting for the same genes which means that over time, that population has a decrease in genetic variation. 
that means that it's less able to adapt because it has it has a smaller bank of genes available to allow it to adapt to new situations. Still got mutations happening, random mutations, but the overall, um, there's, there's that less variety in genes. You also have problems with inbreeding. So if you combine the same genes too many times, you end up with genetic defects. Um, good examples of that are certain breeds of dog in particular. I've chosen pugs here because I had a very memorable experience um, with a pug when I was doing some work experience as a vet and pugs have been bred to have these very short muzzles, which actually means that it's very difficult to, um, it's difficult for them to breathe and it's certainly very difficult to get a tube down their throat to anaesthetize them because their airways are so constricted by those um, really shortened snouts. Um, and in extreme cases, this does stop them breathing. That's why pugs quite often make that funny little noise. Okay. Questions? Right, so I'll pop up the Q&A and I'll start answering the questions that are there already. And if you have any more, pop them in. Okay, so just catching up on some of these. Um, what would personality be? Yes, we talked briefly about this, didn't we? But personality is a combination of genetic factors and environmental factors as well. So um, some of it is um, contributed to by your genes. So genes do contribute to personality as well, but a lot is dictated by how you, you know, the circumstances in which you grow up and the environment that you grow up in as well. So personality is a really interesting combination. There's one question about doing Kahoot. If we've got time, we will do Kahoot today. If not, we are definitely going to do one tomorrow. Um, can we do an exam question at the end? Yes, we've got a whole session tomorrow on exam technique as well. So don't worry, you'll definitely have some practice if we don't get to it today. How are plants selectively bred? That's a really good question. So um, plants, plants breed by pollination, or you can breed plants by taking cuttings from them. So there's two ways you can do um, asexual and sexual reproduction of plants. So you select plants that have the characteristics that you want, and you either arrange for pollination, um, which then, so you might use bees, which transfers them between male and female plants, or you might take cuttings, which is a way of doing artificial um, asexual reproduction as well. Okay, that's a very brief summary. It's a bit more complicated than that. Is the difference between humans and monkeys good to put down in the exam? Yes, definitely use humans and monkeys as an example of evolution if you want to. We're going to have a few more examples as well today. We're going to look at the horse um, and a couple of others too. Uh, a really good example as well, actually, that you could use, there's two that they tend to find in the exam. So one is about some oysters in Canada. Um, they, in the early 1900s, had a really um, decimating disease. You don't need to know the name of the disease, but that oyster population, the fishermen were really worried about it because there was hardly any left. And then a mutation meant that some oysters were resistant to that disease. And that meant that those oysters were more likely to survive and reproduce. And so that gene for resistance was passed on and eventually the oyster population recovered, which is amazing. The other um, example is about some moths, two moths. So when um, the Industrial Revolution took place in London um, and various other things, it, it meant that uh, the trees in London became much darker. It was basically all the soot was sticking to the bark and making them really dark. And there's a particular type of moth that has black and white varieties. And when that change happened in all of that soot, built up on the trees, the black moths were more able to hide and avoid predation by landing on those trees. And so the black variety of the moth became more prevalent.
Okay. Uh, are blue eyes a mutation? That's a really um, good question. They, we wouldn't consider them a mutation. They might have started out as a mutation, but they are um, just a particular allele that you have. Oh, I'll answer the question about my university course some other time because I'm aware that we've got quite a lot to do today, but it was really, really interesting and I'd really recommend it. <laughs> do we need to know about Lamarck for the exam? So today we're looking at the AQA specification um, and you don't need to know, it's worth kind of knowing about Lamarck, but you won't get questions about it specifically as part of this topic. Um, but if you're doing other specifications, it's worth just checking. Um, and double checking whether they, because some specifications like you to know the difference between Darwin and Lamarck's theories of evolution. It's very simple. I think they use giraffes for the example. So worth just having a quick look. It'll be in your textbook as well. Will the topic of population cycles come in this topic? Um, it comes up in ecology. It's kind of part of this topic in a way, but it's only kind of mentioned. Um, but they'll come, they'll do it properly as part of the ecology part. Um, and it, again, it depends on your specification a little bit as well, so worth checking. Okay, hope you've all caught up. Um, I didn't check the chat there, but I'm hoping all the questions were in Q&A. So there's a couple here in the chat. Do you selectively... Oops. breed in plants using stem cells. Yeah, you can do. Um, and yeah, peppered moths, well done. That was the moth example that I um, uh, put through. And there's just a couple of people wanting me to go back over slides. So this is probably the one that you didn't have time to write down. So we'll just pause there for a sec. Couple saying that they're on different specifications. All of this is relevant across all of the different specifications. If you're doing Edexcel, OCR, AQA, um, WGC is the Welsh one, whatever you're doing, this kind of information will come up. It's a core topic across all of them. It's just the specific examples that differ across them. So it's just worth checking your textbook for those. Okay. I think I'm going to move on now. Okay, so taking that idea one step further. Some of you will need to study this in detail and others won't. It depends on whether you're doing higher or foundation. You all need to be aware that it happens. Um, some of you might need to memorize this process, but others won't. So again, worth checking. The principles are that genetic engineering allows us to modify the genetic material of an organism. So this is speeding up selective breeding even more by just putting the gene that you want into an organism. It's an extraordinary feat of technology um, and it is done by quite a complex process. So here we've used the example of insulin. So it's been very successful for insulin, which is very useful for treating diabetes. So this process allows us to produce insulin from bacteria. So we start with a human cell with insulin gene in its DNA. And then we have a bacterium which has a little ring of DNA called a plasmid. If you remember from your beginning lessons about eukaryotes and prokaryotes, um, bacteria often have a, this little ring of DNA. And basically you can use an enzyme to cut out that insulin gene from the um, human cell. And then you cut the same sized hole in the plasmid of the bacteria. So in that little ring, cut the same size hole and then you just put them together like this. So you can see here the little purple insulin gene and the plasmid from the DNA. It's pretty simple so far. It's, it looks less simple in the lab, I can tell you that. 
<laughs> but essentially it is just cutting and sticking together. That plasmid that has the insulin gene in it can be put back in, in its bacteria. Bacteria are really good at taking up plasmids. So this stage is, is usually pretty easy. And then the other thing that bacteria are really good at is multiplying. So your bacteria that has that gene for human insulin multiplies lots and lots and lots of times. And that means that the insulin gene is switched on and then we can harvest that insulin. And it is that simple. You can also, in some cases, put that, um, that plasmid or that, or that gene into another organism. So it allows you to move genes from one organism to another, which is kind of the whole point. So that's the principle. What do we use it for? Some examples. So genetically modified crops are the best examples of these. In the chat, what characteristics do you think would be best for a GM crop? If you were a farmer, what would you want your crop to do? Good disease resistance, fast growth, high yield, more nutrients. Yeah, really good. There's some clues on the slide, isn't there? Uh, selecting the biggest one. Yes, growing fast. That's a really good suggestion as well. Absorbing materials in the soil faster. Yes, you can get that nutrient in the plant quicker so it can grow quicker. Heat resistance. Good. Healthy balance of fatty acids. Yes, that one's definitely on the slide. Okay, really good examples. So examples that we've got on the slide here are for potatoes, um, increased starch content, which is the main nutrient that we get from potatoes. So that gives us better nutrition. You can also breed um, GM potatoes that have resistance to common pests, such as blight. Um, soybeans have been genetically modified to produce a healthier balance of fatty acids. So again, improving their nutrition. There are rice plants that can be submerged in water for three weeks to withstand flooding without compromising the crop. Rice is, um, rice is the main crop for quite a large number of countries across the world, actually. It's a really, really important crop for food security. So with climate change, we're seeing more um, extreme weather events. Flooding is more likely. So we need plants that can withstand being underwater for longer and still produce a really good crop so that we don't have more people going hungry. Uh, I've got another example there of grasses that absorb and break down explosive material in soil. That's a slightly more um, kind of sci-fi adaptation. Another really good example that I read about is there were some scientists at Edinburgh University that basically managed to insert a jellyfish gene into potatoes and the jellyfish gene um, emits a little glow. You can't see it with the naked eye, but it can be read by machines. And so when the potatoes are short on water, they glow using that jellyfish gene. And the irrigation equipment that the farmer uses knows that it needs to water those potatoes. That's crazy. That is just the most amazing example of technology and genetic modification being used to, to um, well, try to save our resources and help with food security, I suppose. So some really good examples there of how crops can be genetically modified. Should we do it? This is a really, really interesting question. It's something that might come up as part of a long answer question in your exam, you know, debate the um, the benefits and concerns of genetic engineering for genetically modified crops. So I put here a good table for the benefits and concerns. Um, so benefits being potential to cure inherited disorders. So this, I was thinking more about humans when I put this example down. So with genetic engineering, um, there is the potential to cure inherited disorder, genetic disorders that occur in children. Um, 
It has current medical uses already to develop insulin. We talked about that. And also in mice. Um, so mice can be genetically modified to be used um, to help develop cures for human diseases. Uh, decreased world hunger and increased food security. That's a pretty big benefit. We have more and more people in the world. It's a big part of my job is working out how to feed um, people sustainably in the UK. And yeah, anything that we can do to help that is a good thing. But it has to be done the right way. So more ethics there. Plants that produce pesticides or are resistant to herbicides. So this is another really good example, actually, for your example bank. So uh, we talked about disease resistance. So some plants can be genetically modified to produce their own pesticide to ward off pests. Others are resistant to the sprays that the farmer is putting on, which means that you can spray off the weeds and the crop is resistant to that. There's a potential to reduce deficiencies, your example, vitamin A. Um, so a lot of children across the world are deficient in vitamin A. And there was a variety of rice that was produced that had a lot of vitamin A in it um, and was a big sensation at the time for um, treating this, this mass deficiency. Unfortunately, leading to the concerns here, that rice was quite expensive because it had been genetically modified, there's a lot of resources put into that, and that meant that it wasn't necessarily available to most of the children that had that deficiency. So availability of genetically modified crops is a concern. Are those crops available to the people that need them most? What are the long-term effects? We don't know. This is new technology. We don't know about long-term effects. Um, one stipulation is that genes may spread to wildlife or the countryside and affect wild populations. So it would be a shame if all the weeds caught that herbicide resistant gene somehow, because then you wouldn't be able to spray anything off. Um, effects on human health. We don't know whether genetically modified organisms might have an adverse effect on human health. Um, the technology is so precise that in some cases that's quite unlikely. But again, because we don't know the long term effects, we can't be sure. And there's also ethical concerns about human engineering in particular. So we talked about the potential to incur inherited disorders, potentially in um, fetuses. Does that mean that we would then be producing designer children? Are we then reducing our genetic variation? Would there then be more chance of humans becoming, say, inbred over time? because it's that variation between us that causes us all to be different. Lots of thoughts there. More questions. While questions are up, I'm going to put these slides back up so that you can keep copying, because I know I'm going quite quickly. These slides will be available to you afterwards, so don't panic if you're not managed to get getting everything down. If you're, if you're a writing learner, then that's fine. If you're more of a listening person, this is probably okay so far. Okay, let's look at some more questions. What does harvesting the insulin mean? Okay, that's a really good question. So, you might not come across this in your lessons yet, but insulin is um, one of the things that we need to treat diabetes. So depending on what type of diabetes you have, you may need to inject insulin into yourself to keep your body's sugar levels um, stable. Something that you will learn about in homeostasis. So insulin is a major, um, a major need for anyone that has diabetes. And so producing that insulin normally takes an awful long time. But if you genetically engineer those bacteria, you can do it a lot quicker. Can genetic modification cause infection? So that's a really interesting question. So infection normally comes from like a wound. And because this is genetic modification, it doesn't have like a wound as such. It's not like you're cutting someone open and putting a gene in them. It's, it's more to do with um, altering cells. Now, if 
you put a gene into a human cell, it is possible, and you'll come across this in stem cells as well. So this links to several other topics and it will make sense once you've covered more of the specification if you're only part way through. Your body can reject cells that look unfamiliar to it. Then you might get an infection. So infections wouldn't be the result of the direct genetic modification, but they might be kind of a byproduct of it if you were in humans. Has a human ever been cloned like Dory the sheep or if not, will this happen in the future? That's a really good question. I think at the moment, I'm sure that it's probably possible. I don't know, um, but I suspect that, you know, the technology is there. We've cloned horses, we've cloned sheep. Um, but I think the ethics at the moment prevent that happening. What are herbicides? Herbicides are sprays that kill off unwanted plants. Sorry, I should have made that more, more clear. So pesticides and herbicides are usually sprays that farmers use to get rid of um, plants or pests that they don't want. So pests might be slugs, they're eating all the crops, certain insects that eat everything, fungi that eat everything. Um, and herbicides would be weeds. So weeds in a crop are a bad thing because they're taking away resources that, you know, they're taking up nutrients in the soil, they're taking up space, they're competing with those crops. Can I define designer children? Interesting question. So, um, genetic modification and genetic engineering has the potential, and it, it, at the moment it is the potential, to mean that while cells are still developing, so while a fetus is still developing, it's in the early stages of, um, of cell generation, cell splitting, um, you could put the genes that you wanted into that child. That's, that's the theory. I don't think the technology is quite there yet, but the theory is that you could do that. So you could say, I want a tall, blonde, blue-eyed child. Um, and the ethics and the possibilities of that are something that it would be really, it's a really good thing to think through. So if everyone then became blonde and blue eyed, we would have reduced genetic variation. Would everyone want to be blue, blonde and blue eyed? Does that child have a say? It's been conceived, it in theory might have choices of its own. So there's all sorts of ethical implications there. Can diabetes be cured if the right cells are produced using stem cells? Would this be possible in the future? Yes, and that does come up in the stem cell section and in the diabetes section as well. Um, so stem cells are something that they're really exploring because in theory, you can use stem cells, um, turn them into insulin producing cells and replace those defective cells that are in the body already. So yeah, lots of people asking about that. So yeah, stem cells is another um, possibility, but genetic engineering has kind of helped in the meantime while that's developing. How do they test that GM crops are safe for human or animal consumption? So there's lots of testing that goes into that, um, kind of similar to drug testing in a way. Um, is it expensive? Yes. Is it a subject at university? Yes, it's a relatively new field. There's lots of research taking place into it as well. If it's something that you're interested in, it's worth, worth looking into. Back to the insulin slide there. Do you have any recommendations of medical journals that are good to read if you want to go into medicine or veterinary, veterinary medicine? Um, it's not exactly my field because I'm more of an ecologist, but um, if you Google um, medicine journals or veterinary medicine journals, the, the major ones will come up. It's worth looking at. I know there's the, there's the British Vet Society or Veterinary Medicine Society or something like that, and they may well have a journal attached to them. A brief check of the chat, but then we need to crack on. Loads of questions, by the way. This is really, really good. Really good questions.
a couple of questions about the exact questions that you might get about this topic we have got a whole hour tomorrow dedicated to exam techniques so i will run through the different types of questions that you might get and how best to answer them Has genetic engineering ever cured a genetic disease? If so, could they do it in a similar way to the insulin? Yes. There are a couple of examples there. Some of them might be in your textbooks, depending on your specifications. So I think sickle cell anemia is one of them. Could you use GM to cure blindness? That would depend on the um, cause of the blindness. Michelle, so if it was genetically um, caused, then potentially there's a possibility, but you need to consider all of the implications there. So yes, if it's a genetic possibility, is it just one gene? Is it many genes that are involved in that? So how difficult would that engineering be? And then you've got to consider getting that, um, that modified gene into the body. So again, that stem cells usually so usually it's better when, when an organism is developing, which is why there's all the talk about embryo um, modification using embryonic stem cells, because they can turn into anything. Adult stem cells, as someone else has pointed out here, Abby, yes, they can be used, but as you probably know if you've studied them before, adult stem cells have the potential to turn into fewer options. So they can only be used in certain cases. Okay. Sorry, guys, let's crack on a little bit more. Okay, so slight change of tack here from thinking about how we can use evolution. We're going to talk how we know evolution has happened. So evidence of evolution, fossils. You need to know the three ways that a fossil can be made and the uh, lesson space has compressed my slides so you can't see the third one. Hold on, I'll write it out for you. So, um, fossils are the remains of organisms from millions of years ago that can be found in rocks, ice and other places. They're formed in three ways. Number one, when an animal or plant does not decay after it has died. So in certain um, chemical or um, temperature conditions, an animal doesn't decay. Really famous examples are the mammoths that are frozen in ice. And I think there was a, um, a person, a Neanderthal, that was frozen in ice that they found. Other good examples are peat bogs. Peat bogs have exactly the, um, the anaerobic conditions. There's no oxygen in those peat bogs. So if something's buried in a peat bog, it doesn't decay because the bacteria that need to do that decaying process generally need oxygen. So it can be preserved totally. And there are cases of people being unearthed from peat bogs um, from hundreds of years ago who have hardly decayed at all. They had died first prior to going into the peat bog, I think. <laughs> um, the classic thing that we think of when we think of fossilization is when the harder parts of the animal, so the bones, are replaced by minerals as they decay and become part of the rock. So there's a little schematic there about that. I'm aware that you can't see the, the text particularly, but you don't need to know it. You can just see that they've used a dinosaur here because dinosaur fossils are the most um, famous. So the dinosaur gear, um, the flesh rots and decays. So bacteria break that down and then it goes away. It's recycled into nutrients in the soil. And over time, um, the skeleton is covered in sand or soil um, before the skeleton is damaged. And over millions of years, that skeleton becomes preserved in the rock. So it becomes mineralized and then becomes part of the rock. And then slowly over time, rocks move, tectonic plates change within um, the earth. And occasionally those fossils are on earth. So cliffs are a really good example of that. Cliffs are where you tend to think of finding fossils. Maybe that's just because I'm from the coast, but quite often um, when changes happen with cliffs that are buffeted by the wind and the sea, 
parts of the rock will move away and occasionally that reveals a fossil. The third option that you need to know about, I will type over here, is the preserved remains of animals. So footprints or droppings are the classic examples. So you've probably all seen um, pictures of dinosaur footprints. There's also pictures of um, very early human footprints, um, dinosaur poo, dinosaur eggs are other things that have been found. So lots of options there. Put that question in red there. Why is the fossil record not complete? Answers in the chat. What reasons can you think of that the fossil record is not complete? Good, you may not find all the remains. Or everything is fossilized. Yep, yeah, exactly. So soft tissue, particularly like soft animals, um, animals that don't have skeletons, they are very rarely fossilized. Generally, you find them, like, you know, the insects in amber, or occasionally they find things like pollen frozen in ice. Yeah, exactly. Um, they may have been destroyed. So there's lots and lots of fossils that are never found. Destroyed by geographical activity, yep, yeah, exactly. And also, you know, the conditions for fossilization, it needs to be around long enough to start to become mineralized and to become rock rather than just being in the soil. I mean, that's that takes a, a chance set of circumstances for that to happen. Great, some really good ideas there. Working out how organisms have changed over time. So this is mainly how the fossil record has been used. It's been used to, um, to prove um, Darwin's theory of evolution by survival of the fittest. And there are some fossilized um, remains or fossil records that give us quite a complete idea of how an organism has changed over time. And the horse is one. Generally, when we think of the horse and fossils, we think of their feet. So we actually want to start at the bottom of this diagram. So 55 million years ago, there was this little um, thing, little animal called a hierocotherium. It was a small swamp dwelling animal and it had four well-spread toes for walking on the soft ground. And you can see in the skeleton there, four toes. Then over time, the ground got drier and they got a bit bigger. So they needed to run more. 37 million years ago, so we're talking a long time in between these, it takes a long time, millions of years for these changes to occur. The next fossil horse that we have a good record of is Mesohippus. That has only three troes. So Hierocotherium had four three toes on the ground for moving fast on dry ground. And as we continue through the years, 25 million years ago, 5 million years ago, 2 million years ago, those toes reduce again and again, and the animal gets bigger and bigger. Um, so the next one up is walking mainly on one large toe for speed. That's a really big toe there. And then we have this one, which looks more like a modern horse. And finally, the modern horse. It's really well adapted for running on hard ground, and it has that one toe that forms the hoof. It does have remnants of the other toes, just tiny little bone or kind of protrusions that are the remains of those other toes that over millions of years have got smaller and smaller and smaller until they hardly exist at all. Okay. And then finally, we need to talk about extinction, um, which is the permanent loss of all the members of a species. Most of this is quite common sense. Um, so reasons for extinction. 
you do need to know the biological reasons and environmental reasons for extinction. And if you think about it, these are quite obvious. So environmental reasons in particular, changes in climate, e.g. the Ice Age. If you think of the movie Ice Age, that's a good, good way of thinking about that. Catastrophic events such as asteroids and volcanic eruptions are the other big one there. Um, which we, we know and we think was behind dinosaur extinction. Biological reasons for extinction um, are, you have to think slightly more about them. So new predators might wipe out a population. So a good example is um, one of the Scottish islands, they introduced hedgehogs to try and get rid of slugs in people's gardens. But actually the hedgehogs are doing a really good job of eating all the seabird eggs. And there's lots of rare seabirds on that, that island. So they're slowly getting rid of them. New diseases, we talked about the oysters, um, the oyster example in Canada, how they got a disease. It meant that the, the um, population was nearly decimated completely. So they nearly became extinct. But then luckily that random mutation occurred that made a couple of them resistant. Unsuccessful competition, there's another one. So competition basically just means um, taking up all the resources that the other species needs. Um, gray squirrels are a good example of that. Gray squirrels and red squirrels. Um, gray squirrels are bigger, stronger. They also have a disease actually that red squirrels can catch. And so they outcompete the red squirrels and that's why we have very few in England. Now. Okay, I've got a case study there about dinosaurs, and then I have one more slide. Oh no, that is it. Okay, let's talk about dinosaurs real quickly and we'll come back to that tomorrow as well. So dinosaurs were the most recent mass extinction event. And there are a couple of theories about how it happened and whether it was, or what environmental reason was behind it basically. So the first theory is that a giant asteroid collided with the earth formed a huge crater in Mexico about 65 million years ago. The resulting fires and earthquakes darkened the atmosphere so plants and animals could not survive. The evidence for that is there is debris from the asteroid and there's also a metal which I think is called iridium that they found traces of and that only happens when there's a massive massive impact. So that's only ever created with a massive impact which is why they think an asteroid could probably have done that. The second theory is that a slow extinction took place from 137 million years ago, so double the time. And another group of scientists think that that is due to a drop in sea temperature. And there is evidence for this in that there's unexpected changes in fossils and minerals in parts of Norway, which we know would have been very affected by a change in temperature. Um, and so this is quite a good example of how evidence can be interpreted in different ways and how fossil evidence can only ever provide part of the evidence needed. We're getting better at finding evidence. There are chemical methods now. Um, and to some extent, we can use DNA occasionally on, on things that are really well preserved. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left. I'm aware that we haven't had time for a Kahoot today. We are going to do one tomorrow. So tune in tomorrow for a quiz. Um, the other things that we're going to talk about tomorrow are antibiotic resistance, because it's a really good example of everything we've done today. So we're going to use it as a bit of a recap. And then we are also going to talk about classification of organisms, which is what's on your schedule. Um, so we're going to do that. And then we'll do some past exam questions as well. And we are also going to talk about exam technique. So a really good session to, um, to attend if you're looking at what kind of questions will be there in, in your exam. And I'll talk you through the best ways of approaching them and answering them so you don't get too stressed. And so you make the most marks um, in those questions. Okay, a couple of questions before we go. I can see there's quite a few in the Q&A. Ooh, in the future, would it be possible to grow organs such as a heart? It is possible already. It's not quite there yet, but yes, in theory, you can use um, stem cells to grow 
organs. If a human is preserved in ice from a long time ago, how does this affect the body? Um, the sheer pressures of it being in ice means that there's been an awful lot of force on it. So they're still not, you know, it's not like pulling, you know, you or I out of ice. It's still, there's quite a lot of structural damage. Um, but in some cases, it is possible to get DNA from specimens that are preserved in ice. So it is remarkably good at preserving. Okay, there will be an email that will tell you about the timings of the two sessions tomorrow. So don't worry, that's coming through. You will know. Are scientists bringing mammoths back to life? I think there's been talk of it. I don't think they're quite there yet. I don't think they've got enough DNA. Okay, so Tilly's just popped in the chat that there'll be an email later today with timings. What are specimens? So specimens are examples. Um, so like you could have a specimen of a fossil, you could have a specimen of some cells. Okay, what happened? What time does this lesson end? <laughs> it ends in about 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm just going to run through any questions that I haven't answered. If you have got some, do bring them tomorrow if I haven't managed to answer them, because there will be more time tomorrow as well. Okay, right. Really good today. Really good lesson. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope it's been useful. Um, as Tilly says, you will receive an email about timings tomorrow. Um, and we'll finish the content tomorrow and then we're going to do exam technique. So it'll be really good to see you there. Um, have a good evening and hope to see you tomorrow.